accept our worship, accept our praise, accept our service. We give you all the praise, Lord. May our hearts be accepted in your sight, in Jesus' name. That the words of our mouth, our heart's meditation, always be accepted in your sight. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For the next few moments, I'm going to talk to you like your brother. Jim, thank you. My burden today has changed. I, yes, I still pray for the sick, but I have two new assignments from heaven. Number one, to strengthen the church. Number two, to, to prepare the young people for the next move of God. And the Lord has given me the privilege in the last few years to speak to multitudes of young people because of my children's ministry. That is quite remarkable. A lady named Lois Gott. Lois Gott is the wife of Ken Gott in England, in Sunderland up there in the UK. She's been friends with us for many years, she and her husband. Her father, used to work with Smith Wigglesworth. My wife's father used to play piano for Smith Wigglesworth. So we go way back. My wife's family is very well connected with Smith and many of the greats that God used in the UK, like the Jeffrey brothers, my Wife's grandmother used to sing for the Jeffrey brothers in the Royal Albert Hall in London. She herself was a very popular uh, uh, you know, singer in England before she was saved. So Lois Gott uh, was in, in our home in the 80s, and she looked at me and she said, I had a vision of you. And she rarely ever had said those words before or even after. She said, I saw you with, with white hair. You, you had all white hair. You walked slower. You looked just about the same. But thousands of young people were in front of you. And I never forgot that. And here it is. It's happening now. And what is so wonderful is I understand that a high percentage of, of, of you sweet people here are young people. And 80%, we hear 80%, I think we were told, of the population of, of, of Kenya now are youth. I was told that by the first lady. So it seems there's a new generation coming up. And I pray God will use the, this amazing, look at all the hands, look at that. All the young people wave. Look at this. Look at this. That's, what, 80% or more of this audience? Somewhere there? 90%. And I want to be able to help you, young people, because, because I, I, I believe uh, that I was born at the right time. Like 1952 was the year when God raised, began to raise people like Billy Graham and Catherine Kuhlman and others. And by the time I was saved, they, they were already uh, very well-known people in the world. And I came about the end of Catherine's ministry because she passed away in 76 and in 1973, only three years before, is where I went to our meeting. 
So for three years, I sat under her ministry. Now I can talk about it. Uh, people like Oral Roberts was my neighbor for 20 years. I, 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 I saw him every week for 20 years because we, we were neighbors. And, and Rex Humbard used to minister. Many of you, probably, you know, maybe don't know the name of Rex Humbard. He was the first man to ever preach the gospel on television in the world. From Akron, Ohio, the Cathedral of Tomorrow was the church in America that was the, the church, the only church on television on Sunday morning. And he was Elvis Presley's pastor. And he, he ministered to every president would call on him. And the three big names in those days in America were Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, Rex Humbard, in that order. And they were dear friends, all of them, to each other. And here Oral Roberts preached for me and ministered in our crusades. And Rex used to preach every Friday morning in every crusade for years for me because he would, he would bring the salvation message. And what a precious man of God he was. And he's in heaven today. And many others, Derek Prince, you probably heard, heard the name of Derek Prince. He conducted my engagement party. He, he, he was the one who hosted and prayed and ministered when I got engaged, so that's correct. So I, I, I met him through the Harlands when I was 26 years old. And he and I took a, a, a trip to the Holy Land together. We joined, and, and before he died, I went to be with him in Jerusalem. So, you know, God has put me in the right place at the right time with the right people of those days. And, and many, many others. Uh, have you heard the name Cory Ten Boom? How many heard of Cory Ten Boom? How many have not heard of Cory Ten Boom? Watch her movie, The Hiding Place. Cory Ten Boom, God used her mightily, and people don't believe when I tell them that. When I was 20 years old, I was in her house dancing with her. I danced with Cory. Amazing. You say, how did you dance with Corey? Well, I was a part of a group called Shekhina, Shekhina in Hebrew, or as you say, Shekhina in English. It means glory. It was led by a couple called Merv and Merla Watson. Merla Watson wrote the song, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You know the song? She wrote it. And I was there in her home when she was working on the song. I most certainly was, because I taught, I was, the, I was their first Hebrew teacher. I taught them Hebrew. That was, this is back in the 70s. So they took a group to Europe in 1974. I was one of the kids. And it happened to be that one of my roommates was Cory Ten Boom's nephew, Danilo was his name. And she came in, and we were in Holland, we went from England to Holland, from Holland to Switzerland, six weeks. We were on a double-decker bus for six weeks, going from cathedral to, cath to cathedral, presenting the gospel in song, in mime, and it was a beautiful thing. 66 young people, they had violins and trombones and trumpets and a beautiful choir, which I was a part of. I was one of the singers. Thank God for that. Anyways, and we traveled throughout Europe, and it just happened to be that when I was in, in one of the homes, that youth with a mission, they, they would put us in all the homes where youth with a mission people were there, and it just happened to be in Holland that her nephew was my roommate, so she came in looking for him, and she said, where is Danilo? I said, well, I don't know, he was here a little while ago. And she grabbed my, I'll never forget this, she grabbed my cheek like that. She squeezed my cheek. She said, where did you get this face? I said, from Israel. She said, shalom. <laughs> and then we were invited to go to her home, and she played, all of us, all 66 kids, and they played Jewish music. 
and she and she we had a big circle of kids and she was right next to me and her nephew on on the other side of her dancing in the garden and that precious woman that we preached on the glove I'll never forget the message as long as I live we went to a church in Zeist Holland and I heard that Precious woman of God, teach on surrender to the Lord. And she used the glove. She said, she said, this is you. And then she used her hand. She said, this is, this is the Lord. And then how you have to surrender every finger to Jesus before he can use you. It was a powerful message. And, and, and she went through every little bit like she said, if, if you only surrender one finger, the glove is still no good. If you surrender two, it's still no good. And all five fingers, she said, must be in there before God can use you. It left an impact on me. So, you know, here I am, 71 years old. These great people have, are going to have, and may I even add, before Cody passed away, she was buried in California, close to where I lived, and her assistant called me to come and see her. So, you know, it's been a wonderful life I've lived. And now I can talk to the young people about... The greats of the past. So I used to ask the Lord years ago in a crusade, in a crusade, I saw this lady under the power of God, and she was just having glory. And I said, oh, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, how I wish I can be on the floor instead of her now. Because she was just beaming with joy, beaming with the glory of God. And I was so amazed looking at her. I said, oh, dear Jesus. I wish I could be on the floor now experiencing what she is experiencing. And he spoke to me just like that. He said, you are my hose. You know, a hose you, you, that you put water on flowers. I said, dear Jesus, I'm your hose. He said, yes. I said, even the hose needs a little water sometimes. And just about, oh, three, four, 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 four years ago, I looked up. I said, dear Jesus, am I still your hose? He said, now you're my bridge. But he said to me, I said, am I still your hose? He said, now you're my bridge. And I'm thinking like, wow, how amazing. I can talk about the great people I saw. Because I was there with them to the new generation. That, that you would know God will do more with you than he did with them. Yeah. If you will pay the price. Yeah. If you're willing to pay the price. And the price is your life. So today, as I minister on the blessed word of God, I want to say one thing. The, the message, the message that I grew up listening to from these wonderful people, Catherine Kuhlman, even all, you know, all of them, all of them, there was one theme in it, the crucified life. That's what we heard. In, in one way or another, Lorne Cunningham, who began, who began YWAM, was the first man I ever heard preach in 1972. I still remember his message. It was on a crucified life. All the greats taught one thing only. They had many messages, but it was one theme, one sermon, basically, the crucified life, dying to self. Jesus being all in all. When, whenever someone had a problem, all you heard is give it to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Today, the message in America and, and other parts of the world is a message of hope, but it's not the gospel. It's about feeling good about yourself. You can make it because God is with you. That message does not stand in times of tribulation. It, it fizzles away. But when you have Jesus, oh, you're on solid grounds because he is the rock of all ages. And his word is, is life. His word is life. And many people today don't know the Bible. That's why they say things such as, Jesus is one way to heaven. No, no. Jesus is the only way to heaven. There is no other way to heaven. 
But yet, you, you hear preachers today in America itself and other parts of the world that don't believe that. And, and they accept parts of the Bible that they only believe in, and they reject the rest. Well, the minute you begin questioning the Bible, you're in danger. Now, God has given us incredible evidence and, and, and powerful uh, uh, proofs, like the proof that, the, that God's Word is His Word in an amazing way. So, if somebody ever says to you, what proof do you have that the Bible is the Word of God? You need to ask them one question. How many prophecies are in any book of other religions? Zero. There are zero, zero prophecies. You can, look, you can check it out. Zero prophecies in any book of any religion today. How many prophecies are in, in the Bible? 2,500. Now, those religions have no prophecies in their books and, and whatever they call their books because they know if one prophecy fails, the whole religion collapses. Yet God gave us such tremendous guarantees that he gave us prophecy. And prophecy, the fulfillment of prophecy, is the guarantee that God's word is his word because you think about the chances of prophecies like that being fulfilled. So 2,500 prophecies are in the Bible and 2,000 have been fulfilled already in detail, in detail. Not, not only about the life of Jesus himself, 300 and 32 prophecies fulfilled the first time Jesus came to earth in details. Hundreds of prophecies fulfilled about Babylon and other nations, the rise and fall of all the nations at the time that existed, and especially Israel in details. 2,000 prophecies fulfilled. There's a great, there's a high chance then that the other 500 will be fulfilled when the Lord returns. So this is amazing. And when you look at the Bible, think about this with me. Written, now the Bible is a library of books. It's not one book, it's 66 books. And now you have to think with me to see the incredible miracle called the Bible. Written written by 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years. That's like someone beginning to write a book 500 years before Christopher Columbus and just finished it last week. The Bible, 1,600 years that these 40 authors wrote it in three continents, in three languages. Yet when the Bible came together, it had one message. Redemption through the Messiah. One message. What are the chances? What are the chances? If Jim Sonero and I or Pastor Joshua and I, or Pastor Dan and I, or Pastor Michael and I decided to write a book about any subject, and we wrote it at the same time, it would not be the same book. If I said to Pastor Joshua, you write a book on, on faith, let's say, and I'll write a book on faith, or, or a book on healing, or any subject, it would not be one book because it'd be two different men seeing it from their side. But, come on, 66 books, 40 authors, most of whom never met each other, lived at different times. And if I said to you, Pastor Dan, or Pastor Joshua, or Pastor Michael, 
and we living in the same time and knew each other to, to write one book on one subject, it would not be one book. But 40 others who did not know each other, the majority of them, never, never met because they didn't live at the same time. In different continents. And now the Bible comes together as one book, one message. That means God is the author. The Word of God is remarkable. So before I speak on the Word of God, I want to read what Billy Graham said about it. He said, millions of people today are searching for a reliable voice of authority. Now, this is Billy Graham. This is not me. I'm just reading what he said. Millions of people today are searching for a reliable voice of authority. The Word of God is the only real authority we have. His word sheds light on human nature, world problems, and human sufferings. But beyond that, it clearly reveals the way to God. The message of the Bible is the message of Jesus Christ, who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. It is the story of salvation the story of your redemption and mine through Christ, the story of life, of peace, of eternity. Our faith is not dependent upon human knowledge and scientific advance, but upon the unmistakable message of the Word of God. The Bible has a great tradition and a magnificent heritage. It contains 66 books written over a period of several hundred years by many different men. Yet the message divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit is clear throughout. The 66 books become one. The Bible is old, yet it is ever new. It is the most modern book in the world today. There's a false notion that a book as ancient as the Bible cannot speak to modern needs. People somehow think that, that in an age of scientific achievement, when knowledge has increased more in the past 25 years than in all preceding centuries put together, this ancient book is out of date. But to all who read and love the Bible, it is relevant for our generation. It is in the Holy Scriptures that we find the answers to life's ultimate questions. Where did I come from? Where am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is the purpose of my existence? One of the greatest needs in the church today is to come back to, to the Scriptures as the basis of authority and to study them prayerfully in dependence, in dependence on the Holy Spirit. When we read God's Word, we fill our hearts with His words, and God is speaking to us. William Phelps, called the most beloved professor in America, and at one time president of Yale University, made the often quoted statement, he said, I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women, but I believe a knowledge of the Bible without, but I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is more valuable than a college course without the Bible. That's powerful. A man named William Leon Phelps. The president of Yale University at one time said, oh, I'd like to read that again. He said, I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women, but I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a, a college course is more valuable than a college course without the Bible. One of the greatest tragedies today is that although the Bible 
is an available open book, it's a closed book to millions. Either because they leave it unread or because they read it without applying its teachings to themselves. No greater tragedy can befall a person or a nation than, than that of paying lip service to a Bible left unread or to a way of life not followed. And I conclude with this, as he said, the Bible, the greatest document available for the human race, needs to be opened, read, and believed. One survey indicated that only 12% of the people who said they believe the Bible actually read it every day. 12% only read it every day of those who say they believe it. 34% read it only once a week. And 42% read it only once in a great while. Now this is shocking because he's talking about believers. This book, what the Bible is all about, will help make the reading and study of God's word interesting. And he gave that in a book that he was, he was promoting and what I thought, I thought it would be so wonderful for me to read just what he said about the Bible. The Word of God. It's a library. This library, and I'm adding to this. This library is a light to direct you, food to support you, comfort to cheer you. The Bible should fill your memory, rule your heart, and guide your feet. It's a mine of wealth. It's the source of health. It's a world of pleasure. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. And practice it to be holy. Now, would you all say after me, I want you to repeat what I wrote myself. Say, it will fill my memory. Say, say the Bible will fill my memory. The Bible will rule my heart. The Bible will guide my feet. It is a mine of wealth. The source of health. A world of pleasure. I will read it to be wise. I will, it I will believe it to be safe, to be safe. And, I and I will practice it to be holy. And now let's go to John chapter 10 with my message. This was all pre-message. Now let me give you the message. I want you to become grounded in Scripture. Because that is what will keep you safe. Today, can you take your mic, please, Jim? Can you come sit by Captain, by Pastor Dan on his side? And Pastor Joshua, sit right there. Thank you. And Jim, right there. One of the main problems in the West, which we hear about all the time, is Mental health, mental illness. I have an answer for those who want deliverance. Great peace have they that love thy law. Great peace have they that love your law, Lord. Great peace. If you want peace, the Bible will give it to you. You don't need medication. You just need the Bible. For the Bible will fill your mind and heart with peace. Fill your mind with the Bible so there will not be room for devils. The reason people are oppressed by demons is the word is not in their life. Jesus said in Matthew 12 that demons look for vacancies. 
What are they looking for? Are they looking for the gifts of the Spirit? No. Because many people today are gifted and have a devil. Balaam was a prophet with a demon. Balaam, Balaam could bless and curse and was a prophet, yet operated in divination. Read it there in Numbers. It begins there in Numbers 22, 23, 24. And in chapter 24, verse 1, it said, in, in, in the prophecy he gave in that chapter, he did, he did not deal with divinations. See? Ah. Well, there it is. That girl back there is magnificent. She really is. Priest. I met her last night. Priest. She is the fastest lady I ever had to work with in putting scriptures so fast. Yeah. I thanked her last night. So what are they looking for? Are they looking for the gifts? Are they looking for power? No. They're looking, is he full of the word or not? Because the word keeps them out. When the Bible is in you, no devil will be in you. There will be no space for the devil in you. Because the word through the Holy Spirit will keep you protected. But now let me add one more thing. There are people who know the Bible that do not know the Lord because they are reading the Scripture as logos. They're not dependent on the Holy Spirit to reveal the Word. So they're religious and legalistic because they don't have the life of the Word in them. So I said to the pastors on Wednesday, I said, if the word is in people, they'll dry up. If only the spirit is in them, they'll blow up. But if the word and the spirit are in them, they'll grow up. So we need the word and the spirit. So if you only know the word, you'll blow up. Sorry, you'll dry up. If you only know the Spirit's power, you'll blow up. If you have both, you'll grow up. And it's time to grow up. And that's why we need to say, Holy Spirit, reveal your word to me. So in John 10, 34, 35, 36, Pastor Dan, the Bible says something very important because Jesus there had said he's the Son of God. And they were questioning him on that. So, let's read the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 34, 35, 36, please. Jesus answered them, it is not written in your law. I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, in answering the Jews, if he's the Son of God, the Lord turns to the Scriptures and says, your law says. In his amazing reply, the Lord mentions the Word of God and the Scriptures. And when the Lord called the Bible the Word of God, what he was saying was powerful. He was saying that the truth revealed in it have no human origin. For it is the word of God, not the word of man. So number one, the Lord says very clearly in this portion that the word of God has no human origin. It comes from the Lord God himself. And then he says that the scriptures cannot be broken, meaning the truth of God's word are eternal. Now, this is very important because in the Psalms we read in Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, 
thy word is settled in heaven. So the Lord Jesus said to us that the word of God has no human origin. Number two, it is eternal. Like David said, settled in heaven forever. It cannot change. It cannot change. Because what he's saying to us is that the Bible is not the product of time. That's what Jesus is saying. The Bible is the product of eternity because it contains in it the eternal mind of God, the eternal counsel of God. And what this means is when time and the world will pass away, the mind and counsel of God revealed through Scripture stands forever. It cannot change. Matthew 24, 35, the Lord said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Why? Because I repeat, the Bible is not the product of time. The Bible is the product of eternity. It contains in it the eternal mind of God, his counsel, eternal word. The world will pass away. The Bible will never pass away. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. In Psalm 119, verse 160, we read, the entirety of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The entirety of your word, Lord, is truth. Thank you, Lord. Every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The entirety of God's word is truth. Now, I, I want to deal with something here that I wasn't planning on, but I need to. I need to. In the early church, in the early church, there, there, there were two major attacks against the church. Number one, the attack against the Lord's deity. Number two, humanity. So John, the apostle John, wrote the gospel of John to prove the Lord's deity. That's why it was written. He said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word with God, the Word is God. So the entire gospel of John has one message, the deity of Christ. That's it. In his epistles, he dealt with the Lord's humanity. He said, if any say that Jesus did not come in the flesh, is on the Antichrist. Because these are the, the main attacks against the faith. These attacks are happening again. Whenever someone says Jesus is not the only way to heaven, they're attacking his deity. Attacking his deity. A few days ago, a few days ago, there, there, there was a program on one of the major Christian networks. Now, I don't have, uh, I, I, I cannot watch network television in my home because I don't have cable and I don't have satellite and I don't have direct TV. I canceled all that. I don't really care to see it. So I can, I can download what I choose to see, not what I'm told to see. So this group of preachers were sitting together talking about, is Jesus God or the Son of God? And I'm thinking, what Bible do they read? What is wrong with them? Have they never heard Handel's Messiah? Have they never read the Bible? I know some of you don't understand what I said about Handel's Messiah. Every, every family in America knows of Handel's Messiah and the world. 
because Handel's Messiah is a beautiful musical. It's all from the Bible, all the Bible. But they don't even listen to the words. They're just listening to the music, most people. But I'm thinking, what, what's wrong with them? Have they never read Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born? Unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. God makes it clear that that son, that child, is Mighty God. Or Micah 5, 2. And thou, Bethlehem of Rata, out of thee will arise the governor, who is from everlasting. God, the baby born in Bethlehem, it's God. Now, listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you right now. You have to understand when people come to you, and they will, and question you about the Lord's deity, you have to ask them five simple questions. Five questions. Number one, and, and you need to tell them that for God to be God he must have five attributes. And you need to remember these. Number one, omnipotence. That means all-powerful. Number two, omniscient. That means all-knowing. Number three, omnipresent. Number four, eternal. Number five, unchangeable. These are the five attributes that prove that God is God. Because, because you have to ask yourself, you have to ask them, is the devil all-powerful? No. Is he all-knowing? No. Is he omnipresent? Is he at the same time in all places? No. Is he eternal? No. Is he unchangeable? No. Do you know any angel who is? No. Any man you know? No. But Jesus is all five. Number one, he is omnipotent because he holds all things by the word of his power. Number two is omniscient because in Colossians it says, in him dwells the treasures of knowledge. Number three, he is omnipresent for he said, I am with you always. Number four, he's eternal. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's unchangeable. He's the same. And he's the I am, not the I was. He's the I am. Jesus never once introduced himself with I have. He never said, I have life. He said, I am life. He never said, I have a map. He said, I'm the, I'm the way. He is. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I shared all that with you last night. But just in case somebody forgot. Jesus is. He is the I am. So it's the Holy Spirit and God the Father. They fit perfectly with the five. Now, his humanity, they question his humanity. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you identify with Adam? I cannot. Why? How can you identify with, with a man who just showed up all grown up? How can you identify with a man who showed up all grown up and knows everything? How can you identify with a man who did not have parents to depend on? Or lineage, where did it come from? But Jesus is the man. Because Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was not created. Adam was. Jesus was begotten by the Holy Ghost. God Almighty took upon himself the form of flesh. God in the flesh, God became a man that we might know him. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to tell you what Billy Graham said about this. I think it's, 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 it's profound. It's profound. 
He said, for God to become a man, think about if you were looking one day at a little ant. At a little ant. And you created that little ant. So Billy Graham said, let's suppose you were the creator. And you created a little animal, a little ant walking about. And one day you're looking at the ant, enjoying your creation, and you notice that the ant was going into danger zone. How would you communicate with the ant? How would you tell the ant, don't go there? Number one, it cannot see you. Number two, it cannot hear you. If you try to speak, it would be like thunder. It doesn't have your form of communication. If you put your hand on it, you could kill it. If you put your hand in front of it, it'll just climb over your hand and keep going. He said the only way you can talk to that ant is become an ant like it. Now, that is remarkable because that's what God did. How would we see him? How would we hear him? How would we know him? So he became one of us. Now, the distance between God and man, the distance between God and man is much, much longer than my distance with the ant. We human beings are closer to the ant than God is to us. And I have no desire to become an ant. Even though I'm closer to the ant than God is to me as a man. I don't want to be an ant. But God so loved you that he disrobed himself of his godly form and took upon himself the form of flesh and was born as a baby. To be dependent on a family. To be dependent on a mom. To be dependent on Joseph, her husband, who was not his father, for God is his father. Jesus not only had a family, he also had a lineage. He came from the tribe of Judah, from the nation of Israel. Adam didn't have any of that. So who can we identify with? Not Adam. I, I cannot identify with a man who, sh who showed up all grown up and knew everything. Fully wise. He didn't have to be educated. But Jesus was educated. He had to learn and grow in wisdom. Thank God Jesus came. In the flesh. He was born. How do you, how do you prove a man is a man? Well, by two things. Birth and death. What do they put on, on people's tombstones? Birth and death. The, the, the date of birth and the date of death. Because that's how you identify a man or a woman. They have to be born and they have to die. And Jesus was born and he died. But how, but how can death hold life? And he arose from the grave. And he's alive forevermore. For he is the son of almighty God. He is God in the flesh. And God's people said hallelujah. hallelujah. To continue now with my message. The entirety of your word is truth. From the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation. Now, let me add one more thing. The Lord Jesus accepted the authority of Scripture. Because when he was tempted, he answered with Scripture. Now, I got to come down and really talk to these lovely people. Because I want to I tell you something very important. Very important. <clears throat> I am telling you. So tell us, tell us, I'm telling you. Now, see, see that scene. Like just kind of imagine it, all right? Jesus is in the River Jordan. And he's baptized. 
by John the Baptist. And the voice of God speaks loud and says, This is my beloved son. Now when God spoke, the devil heard that. The angels heard it. The entire spiritual world heard it. This is my son. So the devil comes a few days later and says, if you are the son of God, turn that rock into bread. Because he heard that. When God said, this is my son, the devil heard that. If you are the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. Now Jesus could have very easily said, weren't you there? Didn't you hear God say so? He never said that. He said, it is written. Why? Because you cannot defeat Satan with your experience. You only defeat him with the word. The word. Jesus could have very easily said, weren't you there? Didn't you hear God say so? No. Now here's what is more, even more re re remarkable, Pastor Joshua. Take your seats. Is that Satan accepted the authority of Scripture. He, ex he, well, he, he didn't argue with that. When he said, if you're the son of God, turn the rocks into bread, Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And with every temptation, he, he came back at him to defeat him with Scripture. Satan never questioned the Scripture. Not one time means he accepted the authority of Scripture. And if Satan accepts the Scripture, how dare anyone deny it? Shame on those who question it. Satan accepted it, yet some preachers don't. Shame on them. Say shame on them for questioning the Bible when the devil himself does not question the Bible. The devil is smarter than those preachers because he never questioned the scriptures. Take your seats. So the devil accepted the authority of scripture. Otherwise he would have argued with the Lord. But when he said it is written, the devil was gone. And you and I defeat the devil with the word of God. I am not afraid of the devil. I really am not because I know exactly how to defeat him. Just like Jesus, I say, it is written, get out. The Bible says, get out. And he leaves. That's why we can resist the devil and he will flee. But there is a bigger enemy than the devil, the flesh. The flesh. You cannot resist the flesh. Oh, oh that's right. Nowhere does it say. I love these young people. My God. <laughs> sit down, sit down so I can talk to you. They are pulling it right out of me. And Pastor Dan, if you move here, I'll come and stay at your place. No, because you see, this is important. The devil does not question the Bible. So we can resist him with the Bible. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, resist the flesh and it will flee. It says resist the devil and he'll flee. But it says crucify the flesh. You cannot crucify the devil. You can resist the devil. That's too much for those guys there. Jeez. I'm preaching it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Sit down. Sit down. So how do we defeat the flesh? We crucify it. And we crucify it through scripture. Paul said, I keep under my body. Lest after I have preached to others, I myself be a castaway. 
The Bible gives us great strength, great power in our life. Because the more you fill your mind, look, I'm going to talk to you flat, okay? Yeah. You, you, now, this is going to help you tremendously. Do not read chapters. Read thoughts. Thoughts, meaning when you read the Bible, break it into thoughts. Example. Example. Let's take Genesis. Okay? Or even Exodus. I began doing that 10, 10 years ago. It changed my life. So when you read Genesis, you take the first thought, which is 11 chapters. 1 to 11 is the story of man. See? That's a thought. From chapter 12 to 24, it's the story of Abraham. From 24 to 28, Isaac. From 28 to 32, Jacob. From 32 to 37, the sons of Jacob. From 37 to the end, Joseph. So you break it up like that. And then when you read the Bible, when you read the Bible, you take the, the first thought, let's say 1 to 11, and you stop. Then you go back and meditate upon that. And remember, because you can remember that a lot quicker than the whole book. So you go back and remember in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void and without form. And, and because now you, 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 you can do that. And nobody is born stupid. Nobody is born smart. We have to train our mind to be smart. So never ever think somebody is stupid. There's no such thing as a stupid person. It is simply trained or untrained. Are you listening? If you train your mind, you'll be brilliant. It's, it's the mind. This is an amazing computer we have. Way bigger than anything you'll realize. Train it. It says renew your mind. But we have to do this very important because we, we fill it with scripture. And we take a thought and we go through the thought. Now maybe you cannot read from 1 to 11. All right, you can read maybe just halfway. Like chapter 1 to 5. Then 5 to 11. Because you can break it down, which is fine. Now, I can read all 11 chapters and go right back and, and, and bang, 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 bang. And I can, you know, I can tell the whole thing. Okay. Now, here's something that amazed me. I began doing that in 2010, somewhere there. Now, there are people here, I'm sure, who understand the part of the mind. So, I was in the hospital in 2015. I had what it's called... Uh, what's called AFib, where the heart beats faster than, than it should. And you can have congestive heart failure because your lungs can fill up with fluids. That is what happened to me. My ejection fraction went down to 14. Bad. Are you, are you a nurse? Doctor, doctor. Now, this doctor knows what I'm talking about. So when the heart pumps... See, mine was doing this. It was not pumping like that. It was, it was just shaking. So I could not walk from here to there. I was, I was completely out of breath. Couldn't even shower. If I showered, I thought I'm going to die. So they rushed me to the hospital. Dr. Tian Song was the man's name from the Philippines. And he nearly wept and said, I will not let you die. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm dying. And they rushed me into emergency, and they gave me LASIK, which began to pump. Uh, she knows what I'm talking about. Began to pump all the liquids out of me. Now, my children came, Michael and Jessica, who you all want to come here. They spent two weeks with me in, my, in the hospital, in ICU. Here was my Jesse and, and my precious Michael and my own son, Josh Walter. He didn't leave me for a second. That's why I love him so much. Well, anyways... Now, they are sitting listening to this. They put me out. The doctors went in with a, with a wire to check my heart and all that stuff. I did not know that. That while I was coming out, now that's what they told me. They were freaking out. They said, Daddy, we thought you were dying. I said, why? They said, well, we were crying thinking you're going to heaven because you were, you were, you were giving us the whole book of Genesis. I said, what? 
they said, Dad, while you were out and you were coming out of whatever they call anesthesia, you were, you were giving every chapter of Genesis. I said, oh, dear God, I didn't realize the power of the mind. The subconscious was picking up the Bible. And when I'm out coming, I was already knocked out. As I'm coming back, the Bible was coming out of my lips. Imagine the power. Take your seats. Imagine the power of the word that can capture your, your, your subconscious that grabs you on the inside with you not knowing. Think about the power of the word of God. Now, meditation is how it happens. How do we meditate? Well, it's quite simple. Just like the cow that chews the cud. You have to go through the scriptures and get all the nutrients out of it. Don't ru never rush the Bible. You're making a mistake. You read it slowly. Asking the Lord to help you see and understand it. And then it just gets right in there. And as you meditate, the nutrients of the word begin to go down in your spirit. And that's how you hide the word in your heart. Yes, it this is the entrance. This is the door. But then you meditate slowly. As the word gets in there, you'll feel the effect. Because it'll begin to change you. Change the way you see life. The way you see God, especially. The, the way you see the church. It just changes everything. Because the, the, that word is in you. And you can do that. Every, everybody, can, everybody can do this. You can break the word. The same with Exodus. So simple, so simple. The same with the Gospels. Now, I would not advise you to begin with a big book. Start with the smallest book there is. Okay? In the, in the New Testament, one of the epistles, like 1 John or 2 John. Or the, just, just begin with the, with, the, with the smallest you can and just go back and think and meditate. And think and meditate. I do that in the shower. I do it when I lay in bed. I do it when I drive. I'm going through that word of God in my head. And then it just captures it. So I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There's such power in it. It literally keeps you and protects you from sin. That's the part of the word of God. And I'm telling you, I pray that the Lord today will create in you such a hunger for the Bible, such a hunger for the Word of God, that you'll never neglect the Word again. The price of neglect is very, very high. Very high. Because the flesh, the flesh and the things of the flesh are attacking us with great speed. Great speed. They're coming at us from all directions, internet, social media, and on and on. We are being bombarded by the filth of the world. We protect ourselves with the word of God. That hour with the Lord, or a little longer if you can, I spend at least two hours with him. You say, I cannot. Well, then at, at least an hour, or, or begin with half an hour in the beginning. Just get the word slowly and shut your phone. You, you, you put that phone on whatever, or shut it, or plane mode, whatever. Don't let anybody call you, and just get the word slowly. It will have such an impact on you, it will change the church. It will change the church. And then, and then you'll see the power of the scriptures that I'm talking to you about. Now, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, not my word. And he said something very remarkable in the Bible. Here's what, what he said in Matthew 5. Are you enjoying this? Good. I have got, I got to come back here again. These people are, they are stealing my heart. The young people of Ghana have stolen my heart. Now take your seats, take your seats. Love you too. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Love you too. Thank you. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Mr. Dan. Not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. 
I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Keep going. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, now, till all be fulfilled. The jot in the Bible, the jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, I told you, I think two nights ago, that I uh, took a course in Hebrew uh, from Hebrew University, and I was a top student, thank God. And, and I, I know Hebrew now, thank God, finally, very, very well. And the thing that I found is, and I found something I didn't even know about the tito. Read that again. Well, verily I say unto you. Verse 18, yeah. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Okay. Now, the jot would be like the yod. The yod is the smallest letter in the alphabet. There's 22 letters in the alphabet, and one of them is called the yod. Just a very tiny, tiny letter. And that's what it means by jot. But the tittle is very interesting. The tittle would be like a curl or a little comma you see. Now, there are no commas in Hebrew. There are musical notes. Yeah, if you, if you study Hebrew, you will see the, what looks like upside-down commas. They're actually musical notes in the Bible. So one day, I am asking my professor, who is a fabulous lady named Sigal Zohar. And Sigal Zohar, I loved my professor. She and I became very good friends. And I asked her many questions. Now, she was not a believer, but my, she knew the Hebrew language and the Hebrew Bible. So I'm, I'm, I'm very puzzled by, I see a dot in the center of a letter at the end of a word. And I said, Professor, why is that there? Oh, she said, very important question. She said, with this dot, it brings in the owner. So what? The owner. I said, please explain that. She said, well, if you see the, the word sus, which is horse in Hebrew, and you see the dot, it's his horse. So if I see the word horse, sus is the Hebrew word, and if you see the dot in the middle of the last word, it is his horse. So it brings the order of the horse into the word. And I thought, oh, dear Lord. Now I understand what Jesus meant, but not even a tittle can be removed. Not a dot can be removed. Not a comma. Nothing can be removed. Now we all know, you know, in the book of Isaiah, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord. There is no, listen, in Hebrew, because I asked her, I said, Professor, I'm always taught that the flood cannot be the devil. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm, I'm, and I read her the portion from Isaiah. Well, here it is, that, that girl is amazing. My goodness, she needs a good raise. <laughs> Dear God, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and its glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, notice the comma. There are no commas in Hebrew. So I said, Professor, explain to me why. Oh, she said, she said, well, let me read it to you in Hebrew. And in, in Hebrew, there is no enemy. It doesn't say enemy. The, the word is tsar for enemy. That verse in Hebrew is completely different. It says, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, his glory from the rising of the sun. But it doesn't say when the enemy shall come in. They put that in the translators because of the verse before that that mentions the same word. But it, 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 what it really says in, in Hebrew, so shall the Lord surround his people as a flood. That, that one little thing just changed the whole message. Now, I'm not saying, go, oh, you know, dear people, that, you know, you need to go and join Hebrew University. Unless you want to, it'll, it'll bless you or even learn Hebrew. But it's amazing how powerful what Jesus said is. Not even a tittle can be removed. 
because it will change the entire meaning of the scriptures. So what the Lord has said here, that the scriptures are so accurate, full of authority, not even one portion or the smallest letter can be altered or removed or changed. Now, let's go to 2 Timothy 3, please. Chapter 3, verse 16. And Jim, you're going to read 2 Peter 1. Oh, I'm going to love that one. Sorry about that. I just got excited. <laughs> okay. Well, you're going to read 2 Timothy 3.16 first there. Uh, Mr. Dan, Pastor Dan. God love Pastor Dan. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I want Jim to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. And, wow. I want to show you something. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a little detour a little bit. Can we put uh, verse 16 on, uh, my dear young lady back there? Second Peter 1 Peter 1.16. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read for you from verse 16, 17, 18, 19 of that portion. Now, this is remarkable. This is remarkable. Now, read what you just read be, before I explain. Oh, oh don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Because let's keep it like that. We'll, it's, it's we'll go back. We'll go back to it. Okay, read that quickly. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All right, now, so what it says here is that the scriptures are inbreathed by the Holy Spirit. I mean, he wrote them. So let's put Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16 up there again, please, if you don't mind, like you did earlier, Okay. Just give me, give me the whole, now watch this. Watch how powerful the word is. It says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now what is he talking about is what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he says in verse 17, it says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, let's just hold it a second here. Peter, James, and John are on the mountain. The glory of God is there. They look and they are amazed by the fact that Jesus that had walked with them was changing. His very image was being changed. His clothing changed. They became brighter than bright and whiter than white. And they saw him in his glory. Mama. Now they see Moses. Now they see Elijah. And now the cloud of glory covers them. And from within that cloud, the voice of God speaks. But notice what they say, what he says right after this. Right after this. Now, now keep verse 17 for... For a while, I'm going to just keep reading. For he received from God, the Father, honor and glory when he was transfigured. There came a, such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my son, beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Verse 18, look at this. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. The voice we heard. Yeah, God, this is awesome. When we were with him in the holy mountain. Now, before you go, before you go, don't, don't change it. They heard the voice 
of God audibly. But then he says something powerful. Next verse. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Stop. What he's saying is that the Bible is more powerful than the vision. Because he said, we saw the glory. We heard the voice. But we have a more sure word. Meaning the word of God is more powerful than the vision they saw. And the word of God, keep, the, keep it up. Keep, keep that scripture up. And the word of God is more powerful than the voice they heard. They said, we heard the voice. Israel heard the voice of God and rebelled. God gave them the Ten Commandments and said, I am the Lord. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He gave them the commandments and within days they said, let's forget about God and build an animal and call it Jehovah. Meaning the voice of God doesn't change you. Only the word of God changes you. You can tell me God told me and God told me and God told me till your face turns blue. My brother, no voice from heaven will change you, but the word of God will change you. That is his voice. That is his word. Who is the, who is the voice of the Lord? His son, the word. They rejected the voice. They rejected the voice in the Old Testament. They said to Moses, we, do, we don't want to hear that again. And Peter says, we heard his voice, but we have a more sure word, a prophecy. Because the Bible is the word, a prophecy. You and I have heard Christians say, well, the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. And, and they don't even know what they're talking about. The Lord tells them this one day and changes his mind the next day because they don't even know that the voice of God spoke. It was their head. The word of God is all. Look, look, God speaks through his word. You, you don't need to hear his voice. You, you already have it in the Bible. Stop looking for supernatural voices to talk to you. And stop looking for prophets who are not prophets. There is a big difference between prophets and prophecy. We all can prophesy, yeah, but we're not all prophets. I got to say it. If it's outside redemption, it is not the word. You have to ask, what has this got to do with my redemption? When they start giving you information about God showed them this and God showed, What has this got to do with my redemption? Yeah. If it has nothing to do with it, dismiss it. Yeah. Prophecy is for what? Edification, exhortation, comfort, not fear and confusion. Yeah. No. A lot of prophecy today gives you fear. Oh, you're going to die. That's not the Bible. Dismiss that nonsense. Dismiss it. No, that's not the word. God doesn't do that. He gave us his word. And we need prophecy. We need prophecy. It's a blessed, wonderful gift. Wonderful gift. Take your seats. I am preaching it. You have to understand if it's outside redemption, it's not the Bible. It's not the Bible. Hallelujah. But the Bible is clear that the word of God is stronger than any vision. He said, we had a vision. We saw the glory. We heard God's voice. We saw Moses. We saw Elijah. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. Where unto ye do well that you take heed. Take heed. As unto a light that shines in a dark place. That's the word. The Bible. 
until the day dawn and the day star, meaning the Lord, arise in your hearts. See how the word will arise, will cause the Lord to arise in your heart and my heart with such power. Hallelujah. Now the psalmist wrote, thy word, sorry, the word of the Lord, I'm, I'm actually Psalm 12 verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The Lord's word has no, please listen, I've heard people say, I found a mistake. There are no mistakes in the Bible. It's only translation. No contradictions, translations. I'll explain that to you. My professor, wonderful lady uh, Seagal, I said to her one day, I said, Professor, why does it say that Absalom was gone for 40 years? I said, we all know that's not accurate because... He was gone for four years, most likely. But I said, the Bible says 40, Arba'im. Ah, she said, great question you're asking. I said, now, we all know that the kingdom of David went for 40 years. So how can Absalom be gone for 40 years? She said, that's because of the Septuagint. I said, explain that. She said, well, she said, the original of the originals had to be translated into Greek because of the Hellenistic influence in that part of the world. Greek became like English today. She said when they translated the Hebrew Bible during that period, they translated that Hebrew Bible into Greek. That is where the mistakes were made. Because, she said, all Bibles are now, or all Hebrew Bibles, come from that translation. The Septuagint. She said, I'll send you for a price. I'll send you for a price the original of the originals. I said, please, how can I get the, the original Hebrew? She said, well, it's going to cost you money. I said, I don't care. And you cannot find it on your iPad. I said, I don't care. The Hebrew University sent it to me. And I saw the pure translation. It said, Arba'a, not Arba'im. So I heard clearly from her, it's not a question of contradiction, it's a question of translation. There are no contradictions in the Bible. It's impossible to even, to, to even think that, that way. Because the Bible says that the word of the, of the Lord is tried in a furnace, purified seven times. So, I want to add, that both Old and New Testament are equal in authority. In 2 Peter 3, verse 1, 2, please, Dan. 2 Peter 3, I'm almost done. Verse 1, verse 2. Well, if you, look, if you, if you want me to go on, I'll, I'll have to come back. So, we can only digest so much in one night. I, I'm giving you a big dinner. I'm not done yet. I'm not done. Second Peter 3, verse 1, verse 2. Because in this verse, we see, we see that both Old and New Testament are Scripture. All right, let's go. This second epistle, beloved. Can we, there we go. Okay. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So he says, I'm writing to you. The second time to remind you. Uh -huh. R remind you what? Keep going. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Now, when he said holy prophets, he means Old Testament. Uh -huh. The words spoken by the prophets, Old Testament. And, and? And of the commandment of us, the apostles New of the Lord Testament. and Savior. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, you should know that. Uh -huh. Prophets old and the apostles new. Simple. So he says, be mindful of what the holy prophets spoke. That's old covenant. 
and what us apostles spoke, new covenant. Keep going, please. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Keep, keep going, because this is important. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning so of the creation. So they were questioning the second coming, and they are questioning it again. Yes, sir. There's a big question about the rapture. Lots of confusion about pre, mid, and post. Well, I'm here to clear it all, clear it all up. Sir? God never, never has judged the righteous and the unrighteous at the same time. In fact, the angel said to Lot, we cannot judge till you're out. We cannot judge it till you are out. Abraham knew it, for he said, the judge of the, whole, of the whole world will not do wrong. He will do right. He knew it. Never do we see God judging the righteous and the wicked together. Wow. In fact, in Isaiah 26, oh, that is such a glorious portion. That's such a glorious portion. I wasn't planning on saying all this, but I think you all need it. In Isaiah 26, God clearly says that he will take us to a place of hiding. For it says in verse 19, that's, and, and that was fulfilled in Matthew 27. But let's just keep reading the whole thing. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise. That was fulfilled when the saints of the old covenant came out from the graves. Uh-huh. Awake and sing ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. That already has been fulfilled when the saints of the Old Testament came out of the grave. Come, my people, that's the rapture. Verse 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were. For a little moment, why? Until the indignation be overpassed. Come hide till the indignation, the wrath is gone. And what is that indignation? For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish who? The inhabitants of the earth. Why? For their iniquity. How severe will it be? The earth will dis... The, the earth also shall disclose her blood, meaning there will be not enough place for the blood to flow, wow. and shall no more cover her slain, meaning there will not be graves, enough graves to bury them. The judgment will fall so massive, millions will die, but my people are in a hiding place for a moment. So verse 19, the saints of the Old Testament, verse 20, rapture of the church, 21, great tribulation. It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. So we have to know when, when they scoffed at the, at the coming, they're scoffing again. They're confused all over again. Now, the Bible makes it clear, makes it clear that everything Paul the Apostle wrote is Scripture because I want you to read same chapter, verse 15 and 16, please, of the same chapter. Because people also question Paul's apostleship. Well, what he wrote is holy writ. It's scripture. It says so. Let's go. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Keep going. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. As they, they challenge, they rest it. They don't want to believe it. But now he says. As they do also the other uh-huh. scriptures. As they do also the other scriptures. Uh-huh. Meaning what he wrote is scripture. Old covenant, the prophets. New covenant, the apostles. And he adds in there that Paul's writings are scripture. Now, what's going to happen to you? Ah, uh, this is important. 
the minute the word of God gets in you, because the word of God is living, powerful, energetic, intense, vibrant, full of activity. It says so in Hebrews 4.12. And it's life. John chapter 6, 63. The words that I speak are life. Yes. That word of God cannot take hold of your heart if there's sin. Because in James 1.21, he says, you have to be free. Read that for us. Let me do it. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness, receive and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, that word filthiness and naughtiness and wickedness is, is, is a very interesting word in the Greek. It combines basically a sinful, a sinful life. So he says very clearly, put that scripture back on, lay apart, put it aside, let it go. All filthiness, all naughtiness, let it go. You don't need it. Stop entertaining it. Stop looking at it. And it's very simple. You say no. You have the power to say no. The new nature in you is alive to say no. And you, wonderful people of God, the more you fill your mind with the Bible, the more you're able to say no loudly. But if the Bible isn't in you fully, your no is weak. Because those temptations are strong. They come from every direction. But be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. And the word of God, like Jeremiah says, is a hammer. Because what happens is when the flesh, the mind, fills with the garbage of the world, that filth becomes hard like a rock. But the Bible can smash it. it. The more you read, the hammer is working. That's it. The hammer is working. It's not only a hammer, it's a fire purifies your hearts. Take it from me. I'm a witness of the power of the word. Hallelujah. That Bible has kept me alive to this day. Without it, I would have been gone a long time ago. I would have been gone and forgotten. But the scriptures keep you. I don't read the Bible to teach it. I read the Bible to live. I'm being honest with you. I read, this, I read the Word of God four times a year. I read my Bible four times a year. I challenge you to do the same. And you can do it if you, if you will do what I told you earlier. Read the thoughts, not the chapters. You can read all of Genesis in less than a week. In less than a week. There are less words in the New Testament than the New York Times on Saturday in New York. Less words in the New Testament than the entire New York Times on the, the weekend edition. And many people in America read the entire newspaper on that weekend. There are less words in the New Testament than that newspaper. Wow. My, my, my. You can read the whole Bible in the whole New Testament, I should say, in one day. So what are you waiting for? Get to know the word. I challenge you to read the Bible once every four months. You can do it. I'm doing it. How many of you have not read the whole Bible yet? I'm glad I am talking to you. You see why I, I'm bringing that message? It's like this in, in many places because I know you probably don't realize that, okay, there are things probably that we don't understand. Billy Graham tells a beautiful story. Jim, please, thank you. A man challenged him. 
that Charles Templeton was a man from Canada, friends with Billy at one time. Charles Templeton was a preacher, used to pack stadiums, and he and Billy were friends. And Charles Templeton went to Princeton, and when he left Princeton, he became an atheist and wrote a book against the resurrection of the Lord and challenged Billy Graham. He said, how can you believe the Bible? And Billy had a tough time from what we heard him say himself. He, 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 he took his Bible, went into a forest, laid the Bible on, a, on the stump of a tree and got on his knees and said, Lord, there are things in your Bible I don't understand, but I accept them by faith. And that changed his life. There are portions of the Bible I still don't fully understand. But it doesn't change anything. Because one day we shall know as we are known. But I know way more now about the Bible than I knew 10 years ago, 5 years ago. Because I see the beauty of Scripture, the beauty of the, even the genealogies. Because every genealogy is leading to the Messiah. It has to do with the Messiah. That's it. My son-in-law, Michael, asked me a question one day. He said, Bob, that's what he calls me. He said, what is the secret to longevity in ministry? I said three things. Number one, build a reservoir of the Word of God in your heart. So when the troubles come, you'll know where to go. Number two. Cling to Jesus. For only the Bible can give you the power to cling to Jesus. And number three, never leave your call. He said, why is that important? I said, because in your call is protection. If you leave your call, there's leprosy out there. When Uzziah left his call, he became a leper. When Saul left his call, he was rejected. He thought he was a prophet and a priest. He was to be the king, not the priest or the prophet. He, he thought he was Samuel, and God rejected him. You stay in your call. You pastors, you only have one sermon in life. Many messages, but one sermon. What is your sermon? I know what mine is. But this is the key, the Word of God. When the Word of God gets into your, your hearts, three things will happen. Number one, faith will be alive. Number two, that's powerful here. Psalm 119, 11 will happen in, in your life. You'll have victory over sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I'll not sin against you. And then something else. You'll be cleansed from within. Because Jesus washes the church with the water of his word. In John 15, verse 3, he says, Cleanse them with your truth. Thy word is truth. Lift your hands to heaven and thank him for his blessed word. His gift to us, his gift of love to each one of us. I worship you, Jesus. Let's thank Him. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds Thy hands have made, when I see the stars, when I hear the rolling thunder, Thy power throughout the universe. Everyone standing, let's bless His holy name. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. God to thee 
how great thou art. That God his son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior. Oh, God, how 